It's recording. Great, thank you. Um, hi everyone and welcome to the third webinar in the um, uh, physical activity series from Birmingham City Council. Um, we've got a really good uh, webinar today um, about physical activity in pregnancy and around that, that period and uh, young children. Um, and um, our first speaker is, is Dr. Molly De, De Vivo, um, who's co-founder of the Active Pregnancy Foundation. Um, and then we've got James Grinstead and, and colleagues from Sport Birmingham as well. Um, and just quickly, the outline of the talk, we're looking at the importance of physical activity during pregnancy, how this is important for mother and child. And we'll follow that up, it links in quite well with the next talk, which will be looking at physical activity in children and showcasing a range of different programs available in Birmingham. Um, we, we're quite keen to get your feedback and in, in between the two sessions, I'll, I'll put the link to the feedback survey um, and any comments, uh, please put them in the chat box. Uh, any questions as well, put them in the chat box. And once we finish the, the first session, uh, Marlies will answer those um, uh, questions for you. Um, and yeah, without um, further ado, we'll uh, crack on into uh, the first talk and introduce Dr. Marlies De Vivo. So that's feedback as well, yeah. Uh, thank you so much, James. Um, just a bit more about myself to give you some, some perspective of where I'm coming from. So I am a senior research fellow at Canterbury Christchurch University, where I run the physical activity in the perinatal period research group. I'm also co-founder of the Active Pregnancy Foundation. Um, and as well, today will be slightly academic in tone, I suppose, um, but if, please, if you have any questions, do pop them in the chat box and I'll do my best to ans answer them at the end of the session. Next slide, please, James. So thank you so much for having me. Um, I realize that we don't have much time today and that there's a varied audience attending, but I'd like to give you a taste of this topic area so that you can see how it links to your practice and community, but then also to signpost and encourage you to explore some additional resources and learning opportunities. Next slide, please. So if we start, by looking at an individual's physical activity journey from the day of conception, it is represented by these guidelines. In other words, there's an expectation for physical activity to be part of your life course. But as you can see here, the journeys of mother and child are linked and already starts during pregnancy. But this parental responsibility, and yes, I did say responsibility, does not end there, it extends into childhood. Now, research has shown us that a child's level of physical activity rises by five to 10 minutes for every 20 minute increase in the physical activity level of a parent. And a similar relationship is also found between parent and child sitting time. So for every hour that a parent spends being inactive, there's an eight to 15 minute increase in the sedentary behavior of a child. And we know that it is here where the vicious circle starts. So children who are less active, and more overweight have a greater risk of developing chronic conditions, being overweight in adulthood and raising inactive children themselves. Next slide. So to continue to benefit from the associated health benefits of an active lifestyle, as part of this life course approach, it is recommended that pregnant and postpartum women also engage in regular physical activity. However, Despite the general and unique benefits, physical activity participation is often lower in pregnant women than the general population. And it's estimated that less than 15% of women are meeting these guidelines. Now this suggests that women who were active before becoming pregnant are falling out of the habit as a result of this life change. In other words, pregnancy and motherhood in itself is a barrier to an active lifestyle. Now literature has shown us that as physical activity decreases as pregnancy progresses. And of course, this is to be expected. But what is really important to recognize is that physical activity does not typically pick up again after childbirth and rarely returns to pre-pregnancy levels. And this tells us that inactivity in pregnancy in the postpartum period may play, place mothers and their children at risk of continued inactivity. Next slide. So one of the reasons for, and confusion around this topic has been the lack of national guidance. And prior to 2017, guidance came in the form of a position statement by the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Then in 2017, we saw the first national guidance released by the UK's chief medical officers. And this was followed in 2019 with a minor update 
but also guidance that extended to the postnatal period, making that link between pregnancy and returning back to normal adult physical activity levels. And this guidance had very specific aims. They were there to provide clarity and consistency around messaging and language, to equip professionals to develop evidence-based recommendations, and to ensure that pregnant women and new moms were aware of the benefits of being active throughout their pregnancy and beyond. Next slide. Now, only a couple of months ago, next slide, please, James. Thank you. So only a couple of months ago, the World Health Organization released their guidance for physical activity, and I'm sure most of you will be aware of this. And these guidelines highlight the importance of regularly undertaking both aerobic and muscle strengthening activities. But importantly, for the first time ever, there are recommendations for specific populations, including pregnant and postpartum women and people living with chronic conditions and disability. Now, what is reassuring is that these recommendations line up to the CMO's guidance, and this paves the way for consistent and clear messages around this topic to be adopted, and thereby facilitating a cultural change and normalizing this behavior in wider society. Next slide, please. I think you'll have to double click on this one. One more. Thank you. So whose responsibility is it then? Next slide. <laughs> So whose responsibility is it then to provide this advice and guidelines? As part of the Dismal Moves project, we carried out some patient and public involvement work, and one of these activities involved a survey to gather information on the practice and knowledge of healthcare professionals in relation to this topic. Now, none of the findings really surprised us, but I'd like to point out that when asked to indicate which professional group they felt had a role to play in the promotion of physical activity, it became quite clear a whole systems approach would be required and that consistency of messages would be key. So promoting physical activity is not someone else's job. Don't make that assumption. It is everybody's responsibility. Next slide. Now, another finding from our PPI work was that while some professionals were aware of these guidelines existing, they had no idea how to use them and how to implement them in practice. And it's important at this stage to point out that these infographics represent some of those key messages, but that behind the messages, there was a conversation that had to happen. These are healthcare professionals' tools or cheat sheets, if you like, to aid discussion. They were never intended as public facing and printing them off as handouts or putting them up as posters is simply not good enough. So with the next section of slides, I'm gonna take you through these infographics to help you make sense of them. And the first thing to point out is that what, what's actually changed between 2017 and 2019. So a minor change in wording, but quite a significant change. In 2017, the message was to accumulate activity in bouts of at least 10 minutes. But we now know that evidence supports the message that all activity counts and that more is better. Next slide, please. One more. Thank you. So what are the components then of an active pregnancy? Now, like the adult population, it is recommended that pregnant women with uncomplicated pregnancies aim to accumulate at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity throughout the week and also engage in 8 to 12 repetitions of muscle strengthening activities involving all the major muscle groups twice per week. But here I'd like to point out again, Recent evidence has shown us that there's no minimum amount of physical activity required to achieve some of the health benefits associated with active lifestyles, with some activity being better th than none. So we do not expect women to be counting their minutes, but rather encouraging, encouraging them to move more. Next slide. Now, typically, an uncomplicated pregnancy refers to where one where a woman does not experience any signs or symptoms that is caused or aggravated by their preg pregnancy. So this means that most women can participate in physical activity throughout pregnancy, except for those with certain contraindications. Now, I'm not going to stand um, on the slide, spend too much time on this slide, but what I'd like to reiterate here is that absolute contraindications refers to conditions where women may continue with their usual activities of daily living, but physical activity of a moderate intensity or higher is not recommended 
as the risks outweigh the potential benefits and could potentially result in a life-threatening situation. Now, what is important to note here is that we are increasingly moving away from a situation where bed rests are recommend, recommended. And then relative contraindications are those conditions where activity should be approached with caution. So the advantages and disadvantages of low to moderate intensity activities should be discussed and may potentially proceed under supervision and with continuous monitoring. Next slide, please. The current physical activity status is one of the core elements of this guidance. For pregnant women who are new to physical activity, so those who are sedentary or were previously inactive, should start gradually and aim for a moderate intensity. Pregnant women who are already active should be encouraged to maintain their physical activity levels. However, adaptation of activities may be required as pregnancy progresses. So for example, contact sports may need to be replaced with non-contact sports or a suitable alternative activity. And as far as possible, pregnant women should be encouraged to adapt, not stop their activity. Now we know that some activities may feel different due to the physiological and anatomical changes associated with being pregnant and that these may require adaptation. So for example, vigorous running can be replaced with moderate jogging um, or walking later on. Strength training activities whilst lying flat on the back can be adapted to side or sitting exercises and adjustment should also be considered for any physical work related task. But generally, if it feels pleasant, keep going. If it is uncomfortable, stop and seek advice. And that's probably the golden rule of being active throughout pregnancy. Next slide, please. So why is it important that women are active? What are those benefits? Now, participating regularly in physical activity has specific benefits to pregnant women. And these evidence-based outcomes or those benefits supported by high quality evidence are a reduction in hypertensive disorders, improved cardiovascular fitness, lower gestational weight gain, and a reduction in, in developing, in a risk of developing gestational diabetes. And in addition to these specific outcomes, pregnant women will continue to benefit from those same benefits as the adult population. So improved sleep and improved mood were adopted from those guidance for, the, for adults. And it's important to recognize that there is no evidence of harm in relation to risk of preterm birth, small or large for gestational age, or any other complications for a newborn baby, such as a decrease in APCO score at one minute. Next slide, please. Now, one of the first and most common questions you'll probably be asked is whether it is safe to be active in pregnancy. And the national guidance is underpinned by three key safety messages. Pregnant women may be concerned that it's not safe. However, there is no evidence suggesting adverse maternal or infant outcomes for healthy women resulting from moderate intensity activities. Now, some activities, as we've already said, will feel different and may require adaptation. So listen to your body and adapt. And again, that golden rule, if it feels pleasant, keep going. But if it is uncomfortable, stop and seek advice. And then finally, don't bump the bump. Certain activities may represent an increased risk of injury through physical contact. So avoid contact sports and activities where there's a high risk of falls or trauma. And then also avoid those associated with physiological risk factors, such as scuba diving and training at high altitudes. Next slide. So brand new in 2019, and for the first time ever, we then saw the release of national physical activity guidance for women after childbirth, really guiding them back to those guidelines set for the normal adult population. Now you'll note that the infographic applies from birth to 12 months, which means that we do not expect women to do 150 minutes on day one, but that we ask them to build this up gradually so that by the time baby is one years old, they could fall back into that um, life course approach to physical activity. Next slide, please. So following a similar format then to the pregnancy guidance, what are the components of an active postnatal period? Now, following childbirth, women should aim to gradually, and I really would like to emphasize the word gradually, build up to accumulating this 150 minutes of physical activity throughout the week. And again, building up to doing muscle strengthening activities twice a week. 
And of course, as I've said before, we know that there is no minimum amount of physical activity required to achieve some of these health benefits with some activity being better than none. And in the postnatal period, particularly in line with the guidelines for the adult population, it is advised that women avoid prolonged periods of sitting and breaking up sedentary time. Next slide. So physical activity status is again important here, but we also consider birth experience and they form the core elements of the postnatal guidance. And it's important to recognize that every birth is different and that every woman has a story to tell. And that as practitioners, we should really be sensitive to these. If a woman has had a straightforward birth, activities such as walking, gentle stretches and pelvic floor exercises can resume as soon as she feels up to it. She does not have to wait for the six to eight week check. However, the six to eight week check is a good time to have a discussion and to tailor advice around whether a woman um, was previously active or not, not active. So for example, if she had an active pregnancy, you can encourage her to gradually reintroduce those activities. However, emphasize that they may need to be changed or adapted initially. And if she wasn't active, encourage a gradual introduction of activities and building up activity levels over time. Now, the next stage is really important. Only after having built up moderate intensity physical activities over a minimum period of three months, and in the absence of any signs or symptoms of pelvic floor or abdominal wall dysfunction, can more intense activities, such as running, gradually resume. Now, we live in a society where we we see celebrities jump back to their pre-pregnancy shapes. And it's really important to emphasize that women take their time and do it right, because getting back to activity too soon um, can have other long-term implications. Next slide, please. So if a woman experiences any of these signs and symptoms of pelvic floor and abdominal wall dysfunction, more intense physical activities should not be resumed and referral to a specialist pelvic health physiotherapist is necessary. Next slide. So why is it then important that we also encourage postnatal women to be active? What are those benefits? And the first thing to point out here is that in comparison to the literature around pregnancy, there are fewer studies of high quality involving the postnatal period. So what do we know and what can we say with confidence based on evidence? Now we know that regularly participating in physical activity in that year following childbirth can reduce depression, improves emotional well-being, improves cardiovascular fitness, and can lead to a reduction in postpartum weight gain and a faster return to a pre-pregnancy weight. And in addition to the, these outcomes, postpartum women may continue to experience the same benefits as the adult population with the benefit message of improved sleep being adopted here. And, and when we say improve sleep, we refer to quality of sleep, not necessarily time sleeping. And we also know that recent research has shown that there is a relationship between poor sleep quality and postpartum weight retention. And then a final note here, the period following pregnancy is a time where women are particularly, particularly vulnerable to social isolation and postnatal depression. So recommending that new moms get active with others their partner, their family, friends, or whoever is in their bubble at the time, is an opportunity to facilitate regular engagement with physical activity whilst also developing social networks. Now, we know COVID-19 and the pandemic has made this really difficult, but we should still be encouraging moms to connect, whether that's via social media or in other ways, with others and to share the, their experiences. Next slide, please. And finally, is it safe? Yes, it is safe for healthy women to be active following childbirth, and there's no evidence of negative impacts on breastfeeding. Breastfeeding when being active at a moderate intensity or when taking part in strength training is safe and does not impact on breast milk quality or infant growth. Next slide. So that was a super quick overview of the guidelines. Um, and I think what I'd really like you to take home is the infographics by themselves are useful but they are tools um, with messages and that those messages require some sort of conversation that needs to happen. But you can learn more about this topic. Um, we have developed an e-learning module with, which sits on the e-learning for healthcare platform under the physical activity health suite. It takes around 
30 minutes to work through and then you'll also be able to get a certificate of completion afterwards. Next slide. So just to bring this all back together and coming back to the This Mom Moves project. So now that we know what to say, we should also be thinking about how we say these things. And discussing physical activity does not mean adding another tick box to your working day or being a specialist in this area, or in fact, telling people what to do. You can start by asking exploratory questions to determine their current physical activity engagement, to determine capability, motivation and opportunities. It all starts with a discussion. Then provide little nuggets of information that lines up to the national guidance. Pitch it in such a way that it fits the profile. And this is really important. Language matters. For many pregnant and postnatal women, exercise and sports are words associated with failure, effort, lycra, gym membership, whereas activities such as walking the dog or playing with children is simply part of daily living and very achievable. achievable. Focus on the positives by emphasizing benefits and safety messages. Change the narrative to what women can do rather than what they shouldn't or can't do. Signpost to trusted resources, activities and support, support. And next time, ask, follow up and keep the discussion going. Next slide. Now, where can you find more information and resources to support your practice? So you head, if you head over to the Active Pregnancy Foundation website, we have dedicated sections for moms and moms-to-be, those supporting moms and professionals. And in each of these sections, we've put up, uh, together a series of suitable resource, resources. And then next slide. And this is sort of a final note around the, the COVID-19 response and what we've done. Um, so we've also during lockdown one and two, and we currently have an open survey. Um, well, well, we had we had these surveys done in association with the This Mom Moves project, but as a result of that, we've been able to put together the Active at Home resource, um, where workouts have been pre-screened to be suitable. So these are available through our website as well. And we've also developed a top tips sheet that can be downloaded. Um, next slide, please. It's all on the next slide. Sorry, James. Okay and it can be downloaded from the website as well to support your practice. And, and that is it, final slide, please. So I think the message that you, I'd like to take, like, like you to take away is that it comes down to all of us. If anything's gonna change, it's gonna take a whole systems approach. So don't assume that somebody else will be doing this. Uh, and then sort of food for thought, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. So, so do pay, pay attention to mums Moms matter. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Molly. That was a, a really, um, really good talk, and it was just some really clear messages there about um, how we've all got responsibility to um, encourage physical activity. So um, I think that was, that was really good. Um, we've got about five minutes for um, any questions that are in the chat. Um, um, Molly, do you want to respond to those in the chat, or do you, do you want just to verbally to answer those, or? Um, I'm happy to stay on and answer them in the chat. Yeah. And throughout, they are not currently coming up on my screen, okay. but um, I'm happy Lewis. to stay on and address those. Yeah, no problem. Um, uh, Lewis, is there any questions in the chat? I don't see any, James. No, okay, no problem. If you do have any questions, obviously put those into the chat. We will um, go on to our next speaker now. Um, it's um, uh, James Grinstead who is um, Senior Partnership Manager for Young People at Sport Birmingham and his colleagues. And I'll um, hand you over to them now. I'll just stop sharing the screen. Thank you, James. And uh, yeah, thanks to Marlies as well for that very good, uh, very good presentation. And so hopefully everyone can, can now see my screen. Um, I just uh, set up the slideshow. So as, as James mentioned, my name's James Grinstead. Uh, I'm Senior Partnerships Manager at Sport Birmingham and so Sport Birmingham is the active partnership for the City of Birmingham and we do a lot of work um, in connection with a, a wide number of partners across the city um, focusing on in, in the importance of sport and physical activity for, for all people and, and my role specifically is focused on, on children and young people. Um, there's going to be a, a few of us speaking um, over the next sort of 20 minutes um, so it's going to be myself, uh, one of my colleagues Nicola who's one of our project officers at Sport Birmingham and leads a number of our projects for, for younger children and, 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 and young people. 
um, and also Helen Tonks, who's one of our partners um, and is the sports partnership manager at King Edwards Aston. Um, so I'm just going to give a, a quick overview, obviously following on quite nicely from Marlies's um, presentation around the importance of physical activity in pregnancy. Um, obviously, a lot of, of, of what was mentioned there will hopefully, if, 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 if mothers are, are physically active in pregnancy and then continue after birth, um, hopefully that will then uh, lead to their children also experiencing the benefits of being physically active. Um, similar um, infographics to, to what Marlies showed. So obviously there's, there's recommendations from the chief medical officer around the, the amount of physical activity that babies, children, toddlers, um, all the way up to sort of when they become adults should be doing. Um, and it's a, it's a whole variety of different activities that are obviously important for them to be happy and healthy, but also for their wider development, their skills development, social development, et cetera. Um, and we'll, we'll speak about a number of those um, coming forwards. And obviously a, a lot of the, the early years, so, so the, the diagram on the left, the early years, um, physical activity is very much around school readiness and getting getting young people to a position where they're, they're moving, they're, they're coordinated, uh, they're sort of their learning development is, is gaining as well as their, their physical development. Um, so obviously wide ranging impacts obviously on physical health, but also on, on a lot more of the, the sort of development as they, as they grow up. Um, so what, what we're gonna do over the next 20 minutes is just um, give you a few live opportunities that are that are out there um, that hopefully could be of use to yourselves and and onwards to your um, your, your families, mothers, parents, etc. that you that you work with. So so initially there's um, this, this is a piece of work that our colleagues up in Manchester have, have put together over the last uh, last year during the lockdowns. Um, very much looking at how they can support parents to, to be physically active, especially in the current climate where they're spending a lot more time at home and uh, not able to get out and about as much. Um, young children aren't necessarily going to nursery so much or, or aren't going to play groups. And um, so very much looking at how they can support uh, families with, with easy activities and, and opportunities that they can do at home or in the garden or, or in their local area. Um, and all of these leaflets that they've set up, I'll show you them in, a, in just a second, are very much around supporting the physical development of, of the, the children and the young people. Um, there's three different leaflets. Um, there's one for babies, which is sort of at that naught to one years, one for toddlers when they're starting to move around a lot more and, and, and walking, running, climbing, um, and then all the way up to preschool. And then following this, I'll pass on to my colleague, Nikki um, and Helen, who will both speak about um, some opportunities for sort of the, the primary and secondary age group uh, of young people. So, so these leaflets um, that they've set up in Manchester and have been used nationally as well, um, have been used by a variety of people, such as health visitors, midwives, uh, nursery practitioners, uh, early years teachers, occupational health services. There's also a lot of community organisations that are starting to use them and family centres. Um, so they're very much seen as being a, a sort of a, a, a leaflet that can be used by a vast range of people um, to, to encourage activity within families. Um, so all of the leaflets are very similar. This, this is the one for, for babies um, and just, I guess, gives, gives an e easy indication for, for parents who, who may not be aware or comfortable with, with what they should be doing with their, their young children. It's obviously a very stressful time. Um, and while they're probably trying to stay active themselves, as Marlies has just mentioned, they also have this very big responsibility of, of supporting their baby to, to make sure they have the best foundation in their life and to, to sort of live a, a physically active life as well. So there's, there's a lot of different ideas and, um, and opportunities on how they can quite simply within the house or, 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 or locally keep their children active and make sure they're getting the best opportunities to develop themselves physically, but also socially um, and, and those, those sort of motor skill development as well. Um, so, so as I mentioned, there's, there's one for the sort of the baby age group, is then obviously a slightly um, extended one for, for toddlers in that one to three age group. And I think a lot of this is very much around making sure that parents are comfortable allowing their children, especially at this sort of toddler age where, where they can be climbing everywhere, running everywhere. I know, know, know this from personal experience. Um, it, it, a, a lot of the time, the, um, 
the parents sometimes think, okay, well, I'm going to stop them, stop them doing that, but because they think, oh, well, if they're climbing, they could fall and they're messing up my health, etc. But I think it's the importance of this stage when they're being adventurous is just allowing them in, in sort of safe, safe methods that that opportunity to be active because it's so important for their their physical development and, and a lot of the things that they gain at this young age can take can take them forward with with their, their sort of the rest of their childhood and, and into adult life as well um, and then even more so when we get to that preschool age this is probably the stage where we when we do a lot of work with schools and primary schools they say a lot of children who come to their school in, in year one when they're five there's a there's a real disparity from those that are already quite active and 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 have developed quite well physically and coordination levels etc all the way to to sort of ones that haven't um, and obviously when, when they are at school it then becomes a lot more difficult for, for those children who haven't got those foundations that they've developed at home or, or in early years settings to then catch up and and obviously that divide we we are seeing and, and I know nationally it's being seen as well. And if, if children are coming to school without the correct level of physical development and, and, and skills around coordination and balance um, and movement, then that they tend to sort of um, fall, fall further behind so that, that that sort of inequality that exists there just gets wider. Um, so there's a very sort of big uh, push at the minute for the foundations of, of being active um, from a young age and, and these leaflets um, are, are a good starting point. And, and as I said, these along with the, the, the other opportunities and initiatives that, that my colleagues will speak about um, are all things that we can we can pass on to you in a variety of ways. And I'll, I'll leave my contact details at the end um, and, and, we, and we can hopefully start sort of publicising these wider across Birmingham and they can be used by yourselves to to uh, support your families and, and, and individuals that you're working with. Uh, if I pass on now to, to Nicola, um, who is gonna speak about one of the initiatives that we've again currently got running at Sport Birmingham, which is the Commonwealth Challenge at Home resource. Thanks, James. Um, so yeah, the Commonwealth Challenge at Home resource has been designed to support families um, and young people to stay active during the current lockdown restrictions. Um, so you not, might not be able to see it too much on the image on the right hand side, um, but essentially it's a 50 day virtual journey from Australia, where the Commonwealth Games were held last time, through to Birmingham. Um, and within that journey, they pass through other countries who will be involved in the Commonwealth Games. Um, the aim of the map really is to encourage movement and physical activity throughout each day of that, that journey. Um, and I think from, from our point of view, we'd had throughout the lockdowns, we've had quite a lot of feedback from schools, families, parents, um, around the fact that they know that there's online resources out there for, for young people to access, to help them stay physically active, um, but they're not necessarily sure where to go to or how to access these, these resources. Um, so as part of the uh, Commonwealth Challenge map, um, we've included example activities that can be done on each day of that journey um, with a link to how to access them. Um, the activities that we've provided on the map, um, they are from local providers. So for example, some of our school games officers have developed these resources, um, but also links to national partners who have developed resources such as the Youth Sport Trust, Sport England, and um, national governing bodies. And as well as the physical activity element, um, we've also linked to the geography curriculum. So as the young people pass through the map and go through the journey, um, they'll reach certain countries where they'll be provided with um, fun facts and information about that country um, and also some questions to answer on it as well. So we've got kind of two different elements within, within the Commonwealth Challenge resource. Next slide. So the Commonwealth Challenge resource we know has, um, has been successful in encouraging young people to stay physically active. Um, we've adapted this resource slightly from a, a resource that's currently used within our primary schools to support with the Daily Mile initiative, um, which is an initiative which aims to get young people um, at school running or jogging at their own pace for 15 minutes with their friends within the school day. 
and we've had really positive feedback from teachers about how this resource has helped motivate and encourage those young people um, within the daily mile. So we know that it's a positive resource that can be used to kind of help support young people stay physically active. Um, within the at home resource, we've provided lots of different activities. So there's activities that you can do individually um, and there's individuals that can be done with your family. So just, an example, just as an example, um, one of the links that we provided is to the Youth Sport Trust who've provided um, an adapted version or sporty version of Monopoly um, and a sporty version of Bingo. Um, and I think the really important thing within this is that all activities that are provided suit any ability level, um, which I think is really, really important. Majority of the activities require little or no equipment. So um, for example, if there's an activity that requires a ball, if you don't have that, they give alternative examples that you, that you could use instead. So for example, a pair of socks instead of a ball. Um, and most of the activities require, require little or no space, um, which is really important if you're doing these activities at home. Um, the other thing to note around the um, resource is that we've also provided incentives for young people and families to, to take part in the map. So once all the days have been completed on the, um, on the map, they can send it into us at Sport Birmingham um, and they'll get entered into a prize draw um, to win, potentially win a voucher, a love to shop voucher for their family. Um, and the other point which I'd like to make, which isn't actually, I haven't mentioned on the, on the slide, is that we have had inquiries from people who might not be able to access technology at home and be able to see this resource or, or download the links that we've provided. Um, so we are distributing hard copies of the resource um, if, if required. So there's kind of the virtual element to it, um, but also we can send hard copies out. And that's it from me, James. Thanks, Nikki. Um, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Helen Tonks. I'm the School Games Organiser for the King Edward Partnership in Aston. Um, and I'm just going to really briefly talk about a, a pilot project that we've been running um, over the course of the last six weeks. Um, and this project has been run with uh, Central Sports Partnership and my colleague Hannah Reid. Um, and essentially, it's been running across the Aston areas um and hall green area as well so some of the most uh, deprived areas in birmingham so can i have the next slide please james lovely um so essentially school games organizers uh, at the heart of what we do is to try to promote uh, the physical activity within schools uh, and those are primary and secondary um and that's been the real driver before the pandemic hit um, but obviously we know now that um, young people and families have been really affected uh, socially and emotionally as well. So what Hannah and I try to do is come up with a project that would be really impactful on families um, across those two areas, uh, not just physically, but socially and emotionally as well. We know that um, the Youth Sport Trust and Sport England have done quite a lot of research on physical activity levels and, and they've been very well publicised. Um, but for us, interestingly, the impact on social and emotional skills in young people, um, the, the findings from that research have actually been really interesting. So we know, for example, that um, in a research done by the Youth Sport Trust, 71% of children uh, reported that they were more active with their family than ever before. Um, and the Steps to Success project that we've been part of over the last six weeks uh, is really grounded in families and young people being active together. Um, and we think that's really important, uh, particularly in the times that we live in at the moment. Uh, emotionally, we, we, we know that teachers are reporting higher levels of anxiety, fear, um, certainly mental health issues have really increased. Uh, not just in the pandemic, but over the course of the last two or three years within uh, secondary schools, uh, definitely, but also worryingly in primary schools as well. So the Steps to Success programme is really grounded in those three uh, pillars, physical, social and emotional uh, skills. 
Uh, and what we try to do is give uh, families and young people the opportunity to develop those, uh, whatever their circumstances uh, have been over the, the course of the three lockdowns that we've been involved in. Next slide, James, please. So um, what we've tried to do is produce a resource um, essentially that's gone home to families, but our biggest um, sort of link with families um, is obviously through schools. Um, so it was really important for us to get school engagement and involvement in what we were doing. And what we know through working um, certainly uh, in secondaries and primaries is that schools now are really focusing on the holistic child uh, it, it's not just about results when they leave in year 11 or in sixth form or at the end of key stage two. And this project really sort of underpins that, that philosophy. So in terms of the school benefits that, that they found is that there's this idea of personal development and young people um, perhaps negating some of those negative impacts um, of the pandemic when they've returned to school. Uh, and hopefully we'll see that even more in the coming weeks. Um, certainly hitting the 60 active minutes agenda, uh, which is recommended for uh, all children. I think that was on James's uh, previous slide. Uh, so 60 active minutes per day of moderate activity. Um, and increasingly parental engagement is becoming really, really important. It certainly is a partnership level for us. Um, and we know that when parents are active and engaged, uh, their young people are more likely to be engaged as well. And all the resources that we've sent out are inclusive, um, regardless of ability. Um, they're all inclusive and can be accessed by any young person across the two partnerships. Next slide, James, please. So this is what the resource looks like. Um, and again, just alluding to what Nikki said about um, access to resources. These are printable. I know lots of schools have printed these off and sent them home um, to, to families uh, in digital poverty that may not have uh, internet access, may not have a printer. Um, so they've been accessible to all young people. There are six weeks worth of activities and you can just about see that on week one. Uh, they're divided into three areas. So the physical me, the social me and the emotional me. Um, and students get points depending on which tasks they've achieved during the week. Um, and as I say, there are six weeks worth of, of those resource cards. Uh, we are at, the, at this point at the end of six weeks. So we've only just finished our, our pilot project um, so we're really looking forward to getting lots of feedback uh, coming back from, from young people and families over the next few days. Next slide, James, please. And then just to put this in a, a slightly wider context, uh, we've had lots of um, publicity and promotion on, on Twitter. Um, and we've managed to get four main partners, one of, one of which is not on this slide, um, but our main partner on this project has, has been Sport Birmingham, uh, who have supported the project, uh, supported young people. And then we've had some uh, sport ambassadors uh, who have been really inspirational to young people and families. So our main ambassador has been Leila Gusketh, who's an England netballer. Um, she's also an NHS doctor. Uh, which has been really interesting to hear her um, experiences through lockdown, um, not only as a, an elite sportswoman, but also um, from a, a, the position of a doctor as well. And then uh, Dan Mousley, who's the under 19 uh, cricket captain, who's our youth ambassador for the project. Um, and he's been really inspirational in getting young people involved. Uh, and then lastly, we were really lucky that we've had some fantastic support from the co-op. Um, they've donated a thousand pounds worth of uh, food hampers, which Hannah and I um, went out delivering this morning. Um, and that's really important for us to, to really push the sort of um, healthy agenda amongst our young people as well. So those young people that uh, really engaged with the project uh, have ended up with quite a large food hamper from the, from the co-op this morning. Next slide, James, please. And then lastly, um, obviously we, we've just got to the end of the first six weeks of the pilot projects. 
um, but we do have some initial impact. So 24 schools have had access uh, to the resources. Um, interestingly, two of those have been special schools. Um, sometimes they can be uh, difficult to access for us. So we're really, really pleased that uh, two special schools have accessed those resources. And as, as a result, we've got around about five and a half thousand families that have um, been able to access that resource. Uh, we've got 26 families across the partnership who have received uh, food hampers or will be in the next couple of days, thanks to the uh, input from the, the co-op. Um, and we're now developing um, a further resource, uh, looking at um, young people being well-being ambassadors within schools. Um, so this isn't just a, a one-off six-week project. Um, it's something that is sustainable and uh, long-term as well. Um, I would just like to finish with a little bit of feedback from a parent that I um, got on email the other day. Um, she said to me that her daughter had really struggled with the idea of going back to school. Um, and one of the activities on the resource card is, is talking to a family member about um, your feelings and, and young people's feelings. And she said as a result of that, um, her daughter is a lot more positive about going back to school. Um, so for us, I think that encapsulates what we were trying to achieve with the project. Um, my email address and Hannah's email address is at the bottom of this slide. Um, the resources are free. If anyone wants to access those resources, um, they're in a, a nice sort of PDF format. We're more than happy to send those out. Uh, what we would like if you do want the uh, resources is just a, a rough idea as to how many people uh, you might be sending those to so we can sort of keep a track of the, the impact that they might be having. Thank you, James. Thank you very much for that, Helen, um, and, and to Nikki previously for that. Um, and then the, the final um, final sort of opportunity, final piece of work that, that we're currently working on that I wanted to speak about today um, is a piece of work that we're doing in partnership with Birmingham Playcare Network. Um, and what we're doing currently is looking to distribute 600 play packs um, out to identified family across six districts in the city. So Birmingham Playcare Network and ourselves have been looking to get some funding um, that is allowing us to do this um, and, and the six districts that we're working on that the funding's come in for um, are obviously indicated there, Ladywood, Perrybar, Hodgeville, Hall Green, Edgebaston, and Selly Oak. Um, I guess one thing if, you, if you've seen a district that's not on that list is that uh, this is a project we've got funding for and we're hoping to scale up um, over the coming months and um, so obviously these are the districts we're, we're working with initially but we would be hopeful that, that obviously with success of the project that they can expand to, to other areas of the city as well. Um, and the packs quite simply, uh, uh, again, a lot of our colleagues up and down the country have done similar things, very much around getting packs of equipment to families that, that need it. Um, so these are going to be identified families, either through uh, identified families through children's centres, family centres, uh, health centres, GPs. Uh, schools, um, so so very much trying to make sure we target the families where where there's most need, um, and and these packs will consist of different equipment that they can do easy physical activities with within the house, so things like a skipping rope, a ball, a couple of markers, um, and alongside some craft kits for for sort of development of fine and fine motor skills and and that wider social development of, of young people as well. Um, and there'll also be a magazine going alongside that, which will have some ideas of what activities they can complete, how they can use the equipment. So it's not just a case of here's loads of equipment, try and try and make the best of it. There, there'll also be some resources that go alongside that, that almost explain different little games or activities or crafts that, that can be made using using the um, the equipment that's in the pack. So those are currently being put together, literally, as we speak, and they're being sort of bagged up and packed up and, and with the aim of getting those out through some some partners that we've already got, but hopefully also some some new partners that, that may be on this call um, out to families that need them in the next uh, few weeks. And again, just an, an idea of a couple of the the sort of the, the things that are going into that magazine and some of the resource cards. Um, so we, within each of the packs, there's going to be a catch 
pad, um, which is sort of a, quite simply a, a tennis ball and two Velcro pads, which which many of you may have may have used when you were younger. Um, and and again, alongside that, there's going to be some some different ideas of activities that they can do. Again, all of these, as with 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 the other projects and initiatives we mentioned, are very much can be done at home, in your house, in your lounge, in your bedroom, wherever um, wherever you 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 you've got. Um, and uh, outside of using the equipment that we're obviously going to be putting into those packs, it, it's using just normal um, household items that, that that people have have in their house, like uh, books, uh, table, etc. Um, so quite simply, there's there's a few different um, physical activity ideas, but also some craft ideas. So I think alongside what um, what Helen mentioned around it being more than just being physically active there's the the social aspect the, the emotional aspect of families connecting as well I think is, is really important and a lot of our work of being able to utilize activity and and, and being active as, as a social family activity as much as the physical development and the physical health benefits it, it, it's, it's much wider than that and there are much more um, benefits to come from from all of this um, so that obviously a very whistle stop tour uh, I think I've stuck to time just about um, of, of a few ideas that, that and a few initiatives that are currently live in Birmingham um, again contact details are there um, if you wanted to speak to someone specifically about one of the things um, but alternatively if you if you wanted to um, sort of speak about it all or get further information in general on, on on wider activities and wider opportunities then please feel free to contact myself and or any of the other um contacts that are that are on that list um so yeah obviously if, if there's any questions i can i can take them or, or respond in the chat um but if not i'll pass back to james right Thank you, James, Nikki, and uh, Helen. There's a really interesting talk, some really great uh, programs and resources there so you've highlighted. Thank you very much. Um, uh, there's There was one uh, thing in the chat, James. I, I don't know whether you're happy for your slides to be shared with, with someone, if that's possible. Uh, yeah, yeah, no yeah, problem at all. Yeah, I can, yeah. Yeah, I, I can send, do you want me to send them via, via yourself? There has been a slight change from the last one I sent you, James, so. Okay, um, yeah, I can, I'll, I'll contact you after the, um, brilliant. Yeah. For, for yeah, that. No, um, yeah, very, very happy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, um, this is uh, a question that we've got. Um, how how are you guys going to be collecting feedback from the steps to success attendees? Um, so, thanks for that question. Yeah, um, we send out a, a Google form um, to through schools really, and they they send that information on. Uh, to families and young people. Uh, we've had a really good uh, take up of the feedback and it isn't just yes, no answers and, and scores. Um, one young lady wrote me uh, sort of half a page of A4 on her experiences, um, which actually is, is really useful. So it's not just about in the pilot projects anyway, the numbers of young people that have taken part, but the actual experience. Uh, I had another um, young lady who sent me a sort of three minute video um, of all the little things that she'd done on the resource cards. So those things are really, really important for us. Um, but in terms of actual raw data, uh, we, we get schools to report that back through, through a Google uh, document. Or uh, if it's a family or a community um, group that have used the cards, they can just email us directly with the, the number of young people that have taken part. I hope that answers the question. Great, thank you uh, for that. I really appreciate that. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, it did answer the question. So thank you for that. Um, um, uh, that's fine. So that's all fine. So thank you very much for um, all of the um, speakers today. Um, it's been some fantastic uh, content. So I really appreciate that. Um, uh, I'm just gonna tell you just briefly about our next webinar, that's next week. Uh, same time, 12.30 to 1.30, we've got um, physical activity in older children and young adults. Um, and we've got Burn Scout Movement talking about the, the, um, the things that they do and how that can benefit physical activity in older children, particularly children that may not be um, particularly interested in, in, in sport and also the other, the wider sort of benefits of Scout Movement as well. And how that transitions actually nicely into uh, young adults. Um, and then we've got Mark Jeffries, who's Director of Sport and Physical Activity at Birmingham City University. 
um, and he's uh, going to discuss different ways that Birmingham City University has helped to encourage physical activity in young adults. So, um, so those should be really, really good. Um, so thank you very much for attending today. Uh, I really appreciate your support. Thank you very much.